So thank you for inviting me along to speak today about using podcasts as a student uh, a sort of assignment format. Um, so I come from Swansea University Medical School, so I'm an old colleague of Nigel's before he jumped ship and went to our, our competitors down the road. Um, so I try and give you kind of a practical outline today of, of you know, why you may want to use a podcast assignment, the potential advantages, the potential issues, how you can go about assessing this as a kind of student assignment format. So I'm sure you're all aware, but um, just to, to brief everybody about what podcasts are and why you might want to use them. Podcasts are a digital audio file made available on the internet for downloading to a computer or mobile device. So in terms of a, a student assignment, we're asking them to complete something that's purely audio only. Um, and so you can probably imagine already there, the challenge to students there is that they can't rely on anything else to, to communicate to, um, you know, communicate the information in the assignment. It's audio only, they don't have any visual elements to rely on. Um, and podcasts as a, as a format um, is increasing in popularity in terms of communication and in terms of education in a variety of, of different sort of subject areas. Uh, I won't read out all those stats there, but that's just to demonstrate that podcasts as a format are increasing in popularity. So as a um, assignment format, it's kind of given students a uh, a real world taste of a different, you know, assignment format they might not be used to. You know, maybe they've done essays, maybe they've done traditional presentations, but this is something that's new, exciting, different for them to kind of sink their teeth into. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, the past year of teaching online and not having as much face to face, there is a number of reasons why maybe you, you might have considered a podcast before or something similar. So, you know, it could be that you wanted to replace a live presentation. Um, so a podcast offers a route for you to do that. So a pre-recorded audio file. You could consider a screencast. So an audio and video, uh, again, pre-recorded. Or you could use Zoom and ask students to present live. Um, but I mean, moving forwards from, you know, the restrictions of, of COVID and the pandemic, you know, these kind of opportunities for students to present uh, digitally, you know, I think still offer perhaps additional learning benefits than, you know, traditional uh, presentation with a PowerPoint screen, you know, in, in front of the rest of the class. So it really depends on what the learning outcomes of the particular presentation, if that it, you know, if that's the assignment you're looking to replace. Um, are. As I said, podcasts can offer an additional challenge to students as opposed to traditional presentations because they don't have any visual elements to rely on. Um, I'm sure you've all seen presentations where students have a diagram on the screen and instead of explaining it, they might just say, and you can see in the diagram on the screen. So this is actually removing that kind of uh, potential crutch, if you like, that students can fall on and say, no, you actually have to be able to explain this without using any of those visuals. So that's a reason why you might want to um, use podcasts, for example, to replace a live presentation. And they can be used in a wide range of disciplines. Um, so if you look into the literature, there's lots of examples of where podcasts have been used, but from a um, instructor standpoint. So either the instructor makes a podcast to deliver content on their module, or perhaps they source con uh, content podcasts that already exist on the internet to supplement their teaching. There are less examples of student generated podcasts. So students making podcasts and, you know, how you can then actually assess that. But if you scour through the literature as I have, you can actually find examples of where podcasts can be used in a whole range of disciplines. So not just in science and medicine, which is kind of my, my discipline, but sports, computer science, economics, political science, music, business, education, and even you know students making podcasts to support other students in terms of student transitions, you know, from uh, sixth form to university, for example. So you know, whichever field you're, you're, you're in, there's probably some opportunity for you to use podcasts. Um, and you can use them for a variety of assignments. It doesn't just have to be 
replacing a, a kind of a traditional oral presentation. You could ask students to make a monologue of something. Um, you could ask students to create a podcast where they're reflecting. So a lot of our students go on to study medicine. So we introduced this concept of kind of reflection on their abilities, on their skills. You know, maybe they observe an interaction of a doctor and a patient and they need to reflect on that. So you could ask them to do that as opposed to doing it in a written format. You could ask them to do it as a podcast. Um, you could ask them to do interviews. So maybe you have students interviewing academics, interviewing researchers and finding out about the research they do and creating a podcast. My particular um, sort of uh, approach to using a podcast assignment in my teaching is to do a kind of journal club. So as opposed to students, you know, reading a paper, meeting in a little group and explaining that to others in their group, the students have to explain an assigned research paper through a podcast. Um, the papers we give them are research papers from academics at the university that I teach at. So it helps expose students to the research that's actually taking place at their own university as well. Um, and it's all based around sort of laboratory-based research. So they have to think, how can they explain the experiments that were done, the data that was obtained, the meaning of that data in a purely audio format where they can't just throw up a graph on the screen and say, well, you can see on the graph that this happened. How can you explain that? without those visual elements. And there's a number of benefits to having a podcast assignment. Um, it can help promote development of critical thinking skills. So if we're assigning students in, in, in the example of my assignment, an entire research paper, and they only have a five minute podcast to convey the story of that research, they have to really think about what the key elements of that paper are. What are the key messages in that paper and how do they actually tell the story of that research in a completely different format than it was originally presented? I run this as a group assignment so it can foster collaborative learning, perhaps even more so than other types of group assignment. So there is the, um, the, the temptation for students, for example, when they you know, do any kind of presentation with slides where they say, right, you do the first two slides, you do the next two, you do the next two, and then they just stick it together at the end. That won't work with a podcast because it has to be one cohesive story from beginning to end. So in order for them to obtain the highest marks of the podcast, they really have to work together to, to work as a team to tell a story of that research. It can help promote reflection on their own ability and their own skills because if they're recording it, they can record it as many times as they like before they submit the final file. So they can record, they can listen to it, and they can evaluate themselves. Did I explain that well there? Was my pace too quick? Is there some other way I could have approached this you know, explanation? So it can hopefully help promote reflection and refinement of, of their assignment before they actually submit it. As I've mentioned, it can help enhance communication skills because we're asking students to communicate purely verbally, no slides, no visual, you know, cues, nothing like that. It has to all be explained through audio. So it can provide that extra challenge maybe for students who might have already had previous experience of giving live presentations. Um, it can promote a deeper engagement with the topic as well. They really have to understand the paper to convey it as a podcast. You know, they, they can't just take sections of the paper and read it out like a verbal essay. They really have to dig deep into it, understand it. I always tell students, you know, in a podcast, we don't need to know how many microliters of something was used. We don't need to know what temperature something was incubated. We want to know why the researchers used that experimental approach. So they have to think more deeply about the research in the paper and understand why the, a particular experiment was performed what it was designed to show in order to tell that story. And it also hopefully encourages students to practice being more creative. So if you don't have any visual elements you can rely on, how can you convey quite abstract, complex scientific elements verbally? So I encourage them to use um, analogies, for example. Um, their target audience in this podcast is other students in the class. So I say, right, 
most of them are the same age or they might have the same points of reference. You know, is there a TV show you all watch where you could use that TV show to somehow create an analogy to explain a scientific concept? Um, it's also about, as I said, it's not supposed to be a verbal essay. It's supposed to be an engaging, entertaining podcast. So how could they do that creatively? Some students like to um, structure it as an interview and they'll actually take on the persona of the researcher who wrote the paper and answer the questions as though they were that researcher. So within the actual assignment itself, there isn't a particularly strict format they have to follow. So they can, they can really use their creativity there to think of something exciting. So as I mentioned, um, the, the assignment that I've run is kind of a journal club style um, podcast. So I have a module, a second year module, Communicating Medical Sciences, which is all about communication. Uh, it's 10 credits and it's a compulsory module. So the students on this module are normally somewhere around 170, 180 students. It's an entirely coursework based module and is set up as a series of workshops which tie into the assignments and try and get students to think more deeply about their communication. The podcast assignment is 30% of the module and it's a group task. And as I said, it's based on an assigned scientific paper. When I give assignments to students, especially if they're kind of group assignments, I try and do help them to an extent manage their, their workload. Um, so I try and give them a week by week breakdown of what they should be focusing on each week, the kind of goals they should meet as a team to make sure they can, they can meet the deadline. So this assignment runs over three weeks. The first week, um, I suggest they spend that week reading and trying to understand the paper and start pulling out the key points. Week two, they should start scripting that into a podcast, start forming it to tell that story. And then week three is that kind of process of recording, perhaps re-recording after a little bit of reflection and then submitting the assignment. Because this is a, a new uh, format for the student and it's also introducing new skills for this particular cohort of students, um, it does require some facilitation. Um, so this particular cohort haven't actually been required up until this point in their degree to actually use scientific papers. Um, so we have a pre-assignment pre workshop where we introduce scientific papers, their structure, what you can expect to see in each section, how you actually approach reading scientific papers. We also have a podcast workshop where we discuss what a podcast is, um, what makes a good podcast, you know, the pros and cons of a podcast as a communication format. And then further to that, we'll have some drop-in support sessions or support provided by email for any specific questions. We also provide some um, examples of uh, other student work where they've uh, done podcasts to try and kind of um, set the bar for students. Um, if we just provided links to professionally produced podcasts, sometimes students get a little bit worried. We're expecting that that high level of production quality. Um, I always tell them, as long as I can hear what you're actually saying, I don't mind if it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of intro music and sound effects. Some students do go to that extra effort and put that in, but in terms of assessment, as long as I can hear what they're saying, it doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles. Now, obviously, because this is the entire module, this is embedded in is an entire communication module. It gives me more scope to do these additional workshops, et cetera. So if you're going to embed something like this in one of your modules, you really need to um, think about what additional support might be needed if, for example, the students haven't encountered a paper before um, and need additional help kind of getting to grips with that first. In terms of resources, this is almost, um, has no cost association. Um, it doesn't really rely on, on purchase of any additional um, software equipment. Um, in, in a pre and post COVID world, students can use a mobile phone, a computer, a dictaphone, anything that has a microphone attached to it. Um, I think only one student has ever asked to actually borrow a piece of equipment and um, library services have some dictaphones available. Um, COVID um, 
as, as terrible it has, as it has been, um, offered some opportunity to actually adapt to the way that this kind of assignment could be run because of the prevalence of Zoom. Um, Zoom allows students to um, record only the audio, so it doesn't have to record video, and it allows each separate audio track to be recorded separately. So if there's five different students in the meeting, they can have five audio files of each individual student speaking, and then they can edit that if they want to chop it together, add sound effects if necessary. Um, there is, there's free editing software available called Audacity, which is free open source software that works on both Mac and Windows and has extensive tutorials available. Students don't need to provide any personal details. They don't need to sign up to anything to download this. I do stress to students that the, the kind of editing side of things isn't essential in terms of marking criteria. Um, I think the, the temptation sometimes is to assume that the current generation of students is very technologically literate um, and they're not. I would say they're very capable at consuming content, but they're not very uh, experienced in actually producing content themselves. So uh, a number of years ago, I ran a video based assignment at another university. And um, one of the feedback comments from the students that stuck with me is just because we watch YouTube doesn't mean we know how to make YouTube videos. So I stress to students in this, you know, if you want to add those bells and whistles of, you know, editing, adding music, adding sound effects, feel free to do so, but it's not required within the assignment remit to do that. And another um, uh, adjustment that's had to be made for, for COVID is sort of how they actually collaborate, you know, so they can discuss via Zoom, but I also encourage them to use Google Docs where they can work collaboratively on one shared document to actually write their script. And uh, a benefit of Google Docs as well is it does track individual contributions. So should there be any issues that arise with um, a member of a group perhaps not contributing and the rest of the group being quite upset that they'll receive the group mark, we can actually use the, the, the group contributions that have been tracked on Google Docs as a way to kind of um, address that situation should it occur. Um, some potential issues for a podcast assignment that you need to bear in mind. As I said, it is a new format. It's likely students wouldn't have done a podcast before. Surprisingly, few students have ever even listened to podcasts before, even if they do actually know what they are. In the terms of the assignment I, I run, it has new skills in terms of its reading scientific papers as well. Um, as I mentioned, there's a technological capabilities. Um, Zoom has been brilliant over the past year because all they have to do is set up a Zoom, someone clicks record, and that's as much as they need to be able to do, clicking a button. Um, and there's also the individual assignment requirements. In this case, it being group work offers its own challenges as well. So it's really important that you've got kind of a clear view over what the potential issues might be and facilitate that where possible. In my case, I used workshops and then email or drop-in support. And also ensuring the students have clarity in terms of the assessment criteria so they know exactly what is expected. Now, in terms of actually assessing the podcasts, um, the way that I've um, gone about doing this is it's a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of the marks are for their topic comprehension and information selection, so how well they've actually understood the paper. And then 50% is how well they've then adapted the delivery of that information for the format. So how well have they structured the podcast, um, how, um, consideration of things like vocal delivery, so the pace of delivery, uh, thinking about things like how they have um, adapted the language and tone for the audience. I do encourage them every year to say, look, you're, you're communicating this podcast to other students in your class. Why not throw in some humor? Why not, you know, make it engaging, make something you would want to listen to? Would you want to listen to a verbal essay or would you want to listen to something that spoke more to you on kind of a personal level? So I really encourage students to try and inject their kind of own personality in this assignment, which they do struggle with because for all of the other assignments they've probably done up until this point, they've had to, um, uh, they've been advised not to inject personality perhaps. Um, 
The podcast has a time limit of five minutes plus or minus 30 seconds. Um, again, that also presents a challenge to students. Um, further to this, they do another assignment with me where they have to write an abstract. So it's kind of, you know, leading them through this process of being able to condense, you know, a whole research paper into a podcast and later on into an even smaller format. We can't do plagiarism checking on audio files, so I asked them also to submit their script through Turnitin as well so that we can have some degree of originality checks being performed on their work. And using the kind of assessment criteria, I'm happy to, to share that and discuss that in more detail with anybody that would like it. Um, it has uh, worked quite well in terms of the range of marks that we've seen is, is appropriate for a second year level. Um, and on this module in the past, I've had three or perhaps four different members of staff marking these assignments and the assignment criteria that I've developed produces excellent consistency between markers. So all the students are receiving kind of the same level of feedback and all the marking is fair. And finally, I'd just like to give you some of the, the student feedback, some of the uh, qualitative feedback that we've had uh, for comments uh, on this assignment specifically. I promise I didn't pay for any of these. These are truly the students' comments that they, they said about the assignment. Um, it is challenging to work in a team, um, especially this year, given that students have been working online for most of their university journey so far. It is very challenging, but I think we still owe it to students to help them develop those teamwork skills and not say, you know, oh, you've been working by yourself at home for the past year. I won't do a group work assignment. I think we still have a responsibility to make sure they develop those skills. So it's run as a team um, assignment. This student um, appreciated the challenge um, and, you know, on reflection felt that it would be helpful in the long run for them and also encourage them to actually start engaging and listening to podcasts, you know, so listening to scientific podcasts outside of the, the requirements of the module to actually understand how uh, data is portrayed. Um, some students, again, it is one of the challenging aspects, but some students do appreciate the challenge of the creative aspect to actually help them develop their skills of communication. As I mentioned, a lot of students on this degree have aspirations of studying medicine. Um, and so they will often need to, on the spot, as doctors, explain quite complex, you know, medical situations to patients. And, you know, they can't be saying, hang on a sec, let me go and, you know, plan a 10 slide PowerPoint presentation to talk you through this. They need to be able to, on the spot, explain complex concepts completely verbally. Um, and there's a variety of other kind of comments we've had as well. The students said it helped them develop through the, the teamwork aspect, um, emotional intelligence, leadership skills, and communication skills, and the ability to select and filter relevant information. So, you know, it is a challenging assi assignment for students, um, but if they approach it with a kind of positive attitude, that it's a challenge that will help them develop, um, a lot of students actually get a lot out of doing this assignment. In terms of my own reflections on this, podcasts are quite enjoyable to mark. You know, I quite often sit there giggling to myself at some of the jokes that are thrown in or, you know, really appreciating that students have gone out of their way to, to make it really enjoyable to listen to. Um, I can say it's probably more enjoyable to mark than a, a pile of essays. Um, it's important to clarify student expectations in terms of the level of study that they're at. You know, with this assignment, I give them quite a lot of freedom to adapt it. You know, do they want to do an interview style? Do they want to, you know, tell it more like an actual descriptive story of the research? So, you know, students can struggle sometimes with freedom in assignments, and sometimes they're looking to us to give them more of a blueprint. So it's important to clarify to students early on, you know, the level of study that they're at. We expect you to go away and do some of this independently and think outside the box and bring us something new, not just exactly what we've told you to do. There's always the inherent challenges of group work, and if anybody has any recommendations about better facilitating group work, I am all ears for that. I've tried the approach of a group contract, which has had varying success, um, but please feel free to send me any 
any suggestions you have about facilitating group work more productively. Um, and there's always, you know, future scope for podcasts, you know, not only student generated podcasts, but as I said, for instructors to create podcasts themselves to help, you know, um, deliver content on a, on a module, for example. Um, in the literature, sometimes giving feedback as an audio file is described as a podcast. I don't particularly agree that is a podcast, but I guess it depends on the approach you use to do that. Um, but I think there is, you know, future scope to kind of broaden the use of, of podcasts. So just kind of summarize my final thoughts on this. I think podcasts represent a modern and fun, if challenging, assignment format that can be adapted to a wide range of disciplines. Um, you can adapt it to a right, wide range of assignment formats, be it an interview, uh, commentary, reflection, um, even in a post-COVID society when maybe we don't necessarily have the pressure to do things completely digitally. I think it still has a place and it's still academically rigorous and can perhaps encourage development of skills in a way that more traditional assignments um, can't. Um, but it is really important to facilitate students to, to develop if there's certain aspects that are, are new to them. Um, so thank you very much. I'd also like to just pay acknowledgement to Dr. Adam Turner, who helped with um, some of the student survey design for this assignment. Um, my Twitter handle is there, Science She Wrote, which is none of the students get that joke anymore because they're all too young to know what Murder She Wrote is, which makes me feel incredibly old. Um, but that's my Twitter handle and my email address if anybody wants to get in touch. So thank you very much for having me along today. Brilliant. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. Uh, there's been some questions that have been popping up in the chat. Um, Quest, while I scroll back and find them, we'd kick off with what sort of time did it take to, to actually mark these? I mean, is it just the five minutes that you're listening to them and then scribbling some comments down compared to reading an essay? What's the sort of match up? Um, so what I tend to do is I tend to sit and listen to the podcast without making any notes. Um, and after that, put down some initial thoughts. But the benefit of having the script is... It would be very hard to write down all of your feedback whilst you're just listening to the podcast. So the benefit of having a script as well as plagiarism checking is it allows you to highlight specific areas that you might want to give specific comment on. I haven't yet timed myself in exactly how long it takes to mark this as opposed to, say, an essay. Um, even if it didn't save much in time, I would say it's probably more enjoyable. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've not actually timed how long it would take. And what sort of group sizes are you using for a task like this? Um, so I've, what, this year was about four to six. Okay. Group sizes around four to six. Okay. So uh, David's popped a couple of questions in there. So do you think podcasts would be good for those students who are unhappy, uneasy with live presentations due to nerves or having recordings of themselves, e.g. video? I think it can help perhaps for students who maybe do have some anxiety around giving live presentations because they do have the option to record and re-record if they're not happy. So it doesn't all rely on that once on the day, one chance at giving the presentation. Um, if, it, if, if the anxiety is purely to do with giving presentations, then yes, I think this can help those students. If the anxiety is more to uh, tied into kind of a social anxiety then we have the issues then with the group work um, I really encourage students to when they do group work not to rely on like whatsapp messaging facebook messaging because that's really not a productive way of collaborating on something but and I think a lot of it's symptomatic of the past year especially this year, even students meeting on Zoom, a lot of them get quite uncomfortable because they're students they've never met in person that they're talking to. Um, I, I'm not really sure how much we can do to kind of improve that situation for them. As I said, you know, the past year of COVID has meant we've had to adapt the way we teach, but I think we still have a responsibility, for example, to ensure students do things like doing group work because they're skills that they will need when they finish. Um, this year was particularly challenging because this is a second year module. Normally in their first year, students will do a group presentation. So this kind of builds on that nicely. Um, but 
in the last year, the, the students that are with me currently, that assignment wasn't carried out in their first year. It was substituted because of COVID with them writing a, an individual piece of work. So for them to have the challenge of group work doing a podcast, and this is the first time they've done it, it was really tricky to kind of navigate the group work element this year. It was it was quite a quite a task, which is why I'm saying if anybody has any suggestions about how to improve group work, please do send them to me because um, I can see that's an area that they need more support on due to the past year of being online. Yeah, sure. Group work's always challenging. Um, I did promise I would send you something I've completely forgotten, so I will send it to you after this. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, a sort of a combined common question from from the two Davids. I think the multimedia era is really demanding interprofessional collaboration with the media, arts and science. And David's asked that as a question. Have you teamed up with other disciplines, e.g. Uh, journalism? No, I haven't. But that would be a really, really interesting approach to, to actually take on this. Um, I'm really all for the kind of STEAM versus STEM, you know, integrating the arts and Given that the creative aspect of this podcast is one of the aspects that students really struggle with, it would be lovely to be able to pair them up with journalism students or students in different you know, fields that are more creative to actually foster collaboration between them. Um, again, you know, it comes down, it comes back to the whole group work issue. Students then having to work with students on other degree programs is, is not something I've experienced or facilitated before so I'd be interested to know if anybody has done anything like that before and whether they felt that introduced more group work issues or helped maybe in some way alleviate some of those but I think that's a really interesting suggestion if the class size I had was smaller I would love to investigate that with 170 going up to possibly 200 next year um, I'm not sure that's something I can take on at the moment but really interesting suggestion yeah uh do you think this is helpful for students with english as a second language so they can plan their dialogue and presentation better yeah hopefully i mean we have a lot of students on our degree that english is a second language and having that opportunity for them to rehearse to to listen and then re-record if they want to i think offers a real opportunity for them to help um, submit an assignment that is truly reflective of their capabilities and isn't perhaps detrimentally effective because, you know, if on the day of a live presentation they get nervous and the, the English struggles. So I think that would be a, a real opportunity to, to let those students reach or demonstrate their academic potential um, through this kind of assignment. I think you kind of answered answer this next question. So do any of them use sound effects other than voice in their podcasts? A few do. I wish more did. A few of them really go all out and they'll have sound effects and they'll have intro music. And um, we try and mark um, assignments without knowing the students' names. So I do say try when you introduce yourself, don't use your real name, make up a name. So students get quite creative with that. I don't know all the student voices, so it's still anonymous for me to mark. Um, so I did have one last year where they introduced themselves as I'm Jess and I'm Fletcher, which is my name. So that was quite a surprise for me to hear my own name in it. Um, but yeah, I forgot the question now. <laughs> which is whether they used anything other than voice, which you, you have answered. I would love if they did it more, but I think as creative as they're being, it's, it's, it's probably too much for me to ask them to be even more creative than they are at the moment, given this is probably the first assignment they've had that doesn't have a, a, a strict format and structure to it where they have to be very professional and scientific. Yeah. Uh, I know something that we talked about so this, this is an interesting question. Is the student developed content released beyond the module? It hasn't been yet. Um, it is something we've discussed recently about doing that so it's something that I will look into doing. Um, it's whether students would be happy for that because, you know, as you said, you know, a lot of students, they don't even want to turn their cameras on a lot of the time in sessions if the session's going to be recorded. So um, it'd have to be with agreement of the students that they'd be released. But yeah, it'd be something I'd, I'd, I'd definitely look into. More of a comment and a question from David is that this must be a moment for audio feedback. Yeah. <laughs> I have thought about this before, about if they're giving me an audio assignment, should I do audio feedback? Um, 
it's something I, I will still explore. I think perhaps when things have calmed down a little bit in terms of teaching the past year has been hectic to give it a word. <laughs> That would be another way of expressing it, yes. Um, but yeah, I think it's something in the future because I think, I think it would help a lot with how students interpret feedback. I think sometimes we can write it thinking we're being very encouraging and constructive. And if a student, the th first thing they'll look at is the grade. And if they're not happy with the grade, I think it can change the way they interpret written feedback. So I think the ability to have tone of voice through audio feedback might help with some of that so it's something that um i'd be willing to explore in the future i think yeah there's definitely emerging evidence that that is the case in terms of being able to listen to to dial mm -hmm. a cap on the, the subtleties of voice and uh, then david waring said you have a very professional looking microphone do you have that for your own professional podcasting <laughs> no i don't do my own podcasting in a former life i was a youtuber um so i don't do any podcasting at the moment but yeah, I've got a nice big microphone here that I bought for uh, teaching online. But unfortunately, no, I'm not. I've not delved yet into professional podcasting yet myself. When, when she says I was just a YouTuber, sort of half a million views on her most popular videos. So quite a good YouTuber, I think it's the, it's a take. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, if there are no more questions or if anybody wants to unmute and ask anything of Jess. Would you be willing to share the, the marking rubric and I can circulate that around the distribution list? I think yeah, absolutely. That'd be more than fine. For people just to, to have a look if they are thinking about that. And um, same question to you is, can you write a sort of one page how-to guide as well? Yeah, absolutely.